Greetings all, Dr. Raphael X here with another video with my friend Jeremy to talk about philosophy. We, we've we been dedicating recently to uh, philosophy of science. So click on that like button, subscribe, notifications, leave a comment, all that good stuff. All right, so today we would like to talk about reality. What makes reality real? Um, is there any primary stuff? So this is actually the first question that has given birth to the logos mentality, the scientific mentality of the first recorded philosopher, Thales, who, because before everything was kind of attributed to supernatural causation, you know, the gods, even natural phenomenon, uh, phenomena was described using, you know, supernatural causes. So the God of fertility causes, you know, the, the crops to grow and things like that. But really the, the scientific question comes in with, well, if everything's changing, there has to be a fundamental cause of the change within the thing. There has to be some primary stuff, the arete uh, or arete. I don't, I don't remember where the accent is in the Greek. That's the first principle of all things. Is that a legit question? Because some people ask, well, maybe there's some type of metaphysical infinitism where you, you can have an infinite regress of things. So we have uh, the, the, the atomists or the atomist, however you want to pronounce it, um, that's actually wrong scientifically because atom means that it's indivisible. But the atomist would ultimately say that everything is made up of atoms, that they cannot be, uh, they're, they're indestructible, right? They cannot be split further. So Thales, the first recorded philosopher, actually thought that water was the primary stuff of all things. Uh, water made a thing a thing and that's the question we're, we're trying to explore what makes a thing a thing is that a legit question at all no, i'm sorry hold on one second let me just okay sorry so sometimes interruptions come in but I, i'll pause the video when that happens so yes pri is there primary stuff so maybe we can also talk about um berkeley barkley berkeley it's spelled uh Barclay, I believe, uh, who was an Anglican bishop who believed that matter doesn't even exist, is is matter the ultimate reality, or is the ultimate reality some type of invisible, immaterial, im, this notion of uh, something we don't know directly, uh, a negation, immaterial, is this ultimate reality? Matter is not, it's just an appearance, it's the phenomenon uh, to use... Um, Kantian language. The noumena is just something that is uh, can't be ascertained. So is this a legit question? It seems so, that there would be um, something, at least, that is indivisible deep down. And even the atomists, who were materialists, believe this, that you get down to a primordial matter that cannot be split up further on. And this is a question of science. It's very much in line with the philosophy of science. This is a uh, key question in the epistemology of science is this legit is there metaphysical foundations also known as foundationalism or fundamentality what have you there's a lot of words they use for this so foundationalism what is the foundation of reality what makes reality real and this is what we're here to explore so timothy if you want to chime in here yeah yeah um so many uh, entry points here right it's such a huge uh, topic yeah. For sure. We can start off with perhaps what appears to be common sense experience, which would um, perhaps be described as that reality is consistent of individual objects among which I am one such object. Right? So if we were to add up all the things that there are, all the stones, all the grains of sand, all the stars, all the trees, all the homes, all the stop signs, all the statues, everything, we would have uh, reality. Like that is reality. This can be called, say, a materialistic phase of thought. When a, a, an infant begins to, in his or her, a perception, uh, cleave off a, a sense of self, a bodily sense of self, there comes the distinction between or so we can speculate. Obviously, we don't remember what it's like to be a baby, but we can try to uh, kind of uh, guess. Right? There comes to be a distinction between myself, the subject, this body here, and the object over there. Meaning, it is a fact that any and all experiences that occur uh, to us in our experience, in our sentience, 
are experiences and as such can be thought of on the same, say, epistemic footing. We can't say that I have some unique knowledge concerning the senses over and above that which I have concerning the stone. This is sometimes uh, an elementary error that is made in, say, naive naturalism, which would be that the only thing I can be sure of are my uh, senses and their sensations. Everything is sensations. I know, okay. I, I know about my senses in the same way I know about anything else. Meaning, how do I know that I have eyes? Well, I can see them in the mirror. I can touch them. That's just the same way that I know that there's a, a, a desk here. Right? I can see it and I can touch it. How do I know that I have a nose? Same thing. How do I know that I have a brain? Same thing. So initially, it would seem to follow that there is a single, say, uh, um, apprehension of reality, meaning by the way of the infant. There's just experiences. And then as I, as the infant figure out, well, some things hurt and some things feel good. This uh, it gets rid of my feeling of hunger. Right? And this gives me a tummy ache. I begin to cleave off a distinct sense of self and say, here is me, uh, uh, such and such individual amongst all these other individual entities. For example, uh, the food, uh, the saucer, uh, the, the, the toys, right? all that kind of stuff. And that seems to be that common sense uh, uh, scheme that we continue on in uh, with in life. Right now, if you want to hop in or I can keep going. Yeah, no, I was going to say that um, the problem with that, because so you're basically talking about a pluralism, which is, you know, metaphysical or epistemological, epistemological, metaphysical pluralism that really individuals exist. But, but the issue deep down is there has to be some type of unifying um element that makes a thing a thing like what makes things things so really and this is the more monistic view so basically it would have to be something that that unifies us so yes there's a you and this is the perennial question of philosophy and science too there's there has to be a unity in the plurality there can't just be pure individuals these individuals have to have deep down some reality that make them that give them being so it's, it's a question that kind of transcends the individual in a sense and it it is looking at them qua being as being as being like what makes a thing a being yes it's individuality okay yes that, that makes it an individual but what makes it a thing so we're saying we're all things but what is that so just kind of going to Berkeley's position, which and is something that you mentioned, we said, oh, we we perceive, we 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 sense uh, that this is the reality. So he is going to equate that we perceive ordinary objects and we perceive ideas. So because we perceive ordinary objects, and because like houses, mountains, what have you, and because we perceive our ideas, that the objects are 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 our ideas. So really what is deep down in reality is not a material thing. It's not a material primary stuff, but rather it's an immaterial um, thing. It, it ultimately, it's our, our ideas. This is Berkeley says, right? This is obviously, this is not true according to a classical philosophy standpoint. And this would be very unsound to apply this. You can apply this to like Christian or Christianity. Christian Catholicism at all. Um, but basically, ultimate reality would be ideas would be, and this is what it was called immaterialism. And and also kind of going to the Zeno's argument, which uh, he said that because a movement is uh, an illusion, because you can't move 50 feet, because to move 50 feet, you have to move 25, then to move 25, you have to move 10, then to move 10, you have to move five. So you can infinitely, you know, um, Parse up. Yeah, you could infinitely parse up, divide the space. So you, since you can't travel an infinite number of points, illusion, uh, movement is an illusion. So this applies also to material things. The atomists, right? The atomists thought they would have to change it. Like the, what we apply to atom now is, is actually divisible. So that, that word cannot apply to atom. So maybe Zeno's argument can apply to that there cannot be an infinite number of material things because they could material thing can always be divided up, and divided up and divided up and divided up. 
So it, it does seem that ultimate reality, in a sense, is uh, is immaterial, is immaterial, which is interesting. And this is what quantum mechanics seems to um, seems to prove, at least not prove, but it seems to show because really because the the subatomic realities they don't follow the mac on the macro level the Newtonian physics they they're kind of very unpredictable right you can they act according to right probable uh, you can pro you can predict what's going to happen but it's never sure so and even consciousness and free will is kind of um um kind of use quantum mechanics but we could talk about that that a little later if we have time but um basically it's that that really what is it that makes things things is that even a legit question is that does it are we getting to does that even matter is that question or is there is there an infinitism is there an infinitism which we can't really get to the bottom uh, the the first stuff of all things but go ahead if you want to kind yeah. of but if you yeah. want to get to, i know you like the more the epistemological realm so if you want to take it that you know in that sense yeah no some great points so let's try to kind of tile that together if possible. Um, so we said that the first phase uh, uh, of the child is one such that, or the infant, I begin to distinguish myself as a subject over and above, or as distinct from other objects. So we can uh, uh, try to take that critical approach, for example, along the lines of a Berkeley, just as an example, and think about what can the nature of this purported plurality b there we go right and is there really such a plurality and can there be and so forth so let's try to get concrete um you can take a stone right this is a, a, as solid me, enough i'm sorry let me just say because just according to your night when you talk about naive realism that is very much associated asso associated with plurality i'm sorry to interrupt you because some people say well if you're if you're, you're not monistic, you're just based on a naive reality, which you mentioned, it's an important point I forgot to mention, because you, you just affirm pluralism, right, naively. Right, right. N nominalism, that there's no universals, there's just the uh, collocations of individual items, right? trillions and trillions and quintillions of things, and that is reality, and the sum total of that is reality. Let's try to uh, maybe grasp a, a salient idea such that, yeah, so uh, as I was saying, um, we could try to take a concrete example, really think through it and, and see as to whether or not it can uh, level us up to a, a possibly more sophisticated phase of thought, right? Along the lines of a Berkeley or any real critical thinker concerning, say, the phenomenal world, such as a Kant or whoever else. So take, take a stone, right? A stone is about as concrete and real an object as it gets, right? It, it can compare everything it's as real as a stone. It's it. Don't ask me why I have a stone, you know, massage a little bit. But um, we see the stone and we see that uh, it can, it's conveyed to us as a sight. And I close my eyes and it's gone. Right now, the sight of the stone varies based on an innumerable amount of factors. If I bring it closer to my eyes, I see one thing. I move it farther away. I see another thing. I flip it like this, another thing like this, another thing, so forth and so on. I dim the lights. It'll be one thing. I put on uh, LED lights or strobe lighting or whatnot. It's going to be a different thing. Further, uh, there's different ways to, other ways to apprehend it by the way of the other senses. I can touch it. It doesn't smell much, right? So basically touch, maybe may make a sound, all kinds of sounds, right? Uh, the touch also depends on maybe uh, my nerves are numb, so I don't really feel it, whatever the case might be. So the conventional, uh, or there seem to be then two options, right? Uh, one option is that there is some kind of nominal stone, meaning thing in itself, stone, such that its interaction with my sensory systems produces these different images. And that is, of course, the conventional view, right? There is here something such as is the actual stone, and it's somehow translated into my consciousness. Or the appearances, all of these innumerable appearances of the stone, as we just described, are directly brought into my sentience via some cause that could so cause it, that could so bring it about. Now, as for the first option, right, we see that there are tremendous problems with any such view. Um, that there is a thing in itself stone, 
and via fundamentally unknowable means. And let's not get deceived by familiar terms. Oh, the photons bounce off of the atoms. These are just words, right? It, it, uh, fundamentally unknowable means something in itself stone, some way, somehow gets shoved into my sentience. Again, there's so many books written to critique that account. I mean, it comes from, first of all, dividing reality up into primary qualities and secondary qualities, uh, uh, color, sounds, taste, all of that is quote unquote mental. The primary qualities are quote unquote physical, right? Off of those primary qualities, they're numericized, mathematicized, a world image is built, right? Inferences are from it made to lead to other terms such as the atoms and the electrons and whatnot. And, and then somehow that phys physical uh, reality, which is uh, an aspect that it's something we come up with, right? By stripping reality off of the uh, secondary qualities that is somehow supposed to interact with the mental. So we get this huge stew, uh, uh, which is really illogical. The other option then would be that each appearance of the stone is logically brought into my sentience as applicable and as appropriate, right? And then the question obviously would be begged as to how is that possible, right? What possible cause is commensurate to being able to bring about uh, any and all appearances as logically appropriate? Again, hopefully it's, it's clear enough, right? I can see innumerable things in the world, right? from each and every angle, each and every lighting condition, each and everything, right? I can see my place of living from a drone up high, right? From a mile away from binoculars, as I get closer to it, it gets bigger. As I move away, it gets smaller. It, it gets dark, right? It, it's, it's, it looks different, it gets light. It looks different. Either all of those appearances exist simultaneously, which they don't, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody right now sees the back of my head. That sight does not exist anywhere. I, nobody sees uh, uh, shipwrecks around whom there are no people. Nobody sees all the innumerable treasures buried in the earth. Nobody sees, um, uh, you know, hopefully one's internal organs. All of these possible experiences do not exist at any given moment. So how do, do they exist when logically appropriate, when the time is right? Again, if we dismiss the account that there's a thing in itself for each of these things such that causes those appearances, what would you say is the only then um, answer that our finite understanding can come up with? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely there has to be a basis for that. Like you, it, it, there can't be an infinite number of appearances um, without a, a base reality as a subject or as a support or as the you can say the edifice, the very foundation, the source of that reality. So there has to be a source for sure. Um, turning to Barclay, though, he would say, and this is kind of similar to what you were saying, but I don't think you would believe in this principle that to be is to be perceived, which is interesting. So the perception is what causes being. If, it, if it's not perceived, it's not is is not being now he doesn't he didn't believe that in in the strict kind of materialist secular materialist way that whatever is not perceived is not uh is not existing in an absolute sense like he he be, he he believed in god so ultimately since god is perceiving all things and there's some truth to this god is perceiving all things things exist in themselves now he's he's getting into some problems because now um it seems like our, um, like we're not the cause of our existence, almost like a condition or even an occasion of our existence. God is kind of uh, doing everything. He's, he is sustaining our existence, but even uh, we're not an independent reality at all, which which can be problematic uh, in philosophy. So um, so basically, the perception of the, creates the being. And, and in quantum mechanics, this seems to be proven, which is very strange. That things are not certain particles, uh, subatomic particles are not anywhere until they are perceived to be in a place. It sounds very strange, and that's why Einstein called it spooky science. And, and it seems to be proven. He actually had a it wasn't a bet, but he had like a we could say a competition with Niels Bohr, and Niels Bohr believed the quantum principle, which was that. And I don't know how they proved it. 
through testing, but he Einstein was proven wrong. So he was shocked by how meta quantum mechanics does affirm that um, Berkeleyan principle that to be is to be perceived. But again, it has to be rooted rooted in in God, as Berkeley would believe that um, that really God is is the ultimate reason, the source of the being. But go ahead if you want to. Maybe we could wrap it up today. We'll do a shorter video today because. Yeah, something just came up, but uh, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. I'll give you the great points. Yeah, let's just try to then try to grasp this one one thing, right? I mean, it's very interesting what any uh, what can be said in any given modern milieu. By the way, in physical philosophy, whether it's the quantum, the schmantum, this and that, I think it's problematic in philosophy to evoke these passing conceptions because they're one thing today, another thing tomorrow. Who knows what is being said in the first place? So we try to use kind of a, a pure reason, so to say or thought, and we can hopefully attain a more clarity. So again, take a, a red apple, right? It's an experience of mine. On the one hand, it's inconceivable and it's completely uh, irrational, meaningless to say that any aspects of the apple can exist without a, a, a percipient or without a perceiver, should we say. Percipient might be the wrong word. Red only exists in connection with an eye that is not colorblind. They're eyes. So does. Good. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's a loud speaker. Go good, ahead. Good. So does the taste of the apple. What does it mean to say the taste, which can be sweet or sour, exists separately of, of the perceiver? So there's the smell right. of the apple. So does the tangible feel of the apple. So on the one hand, it seems uh, correct to say uh, that it, all of this, like you said, and like Berkeley may have suggested, essence equals perception, right? The apple is simply the the the, the phenomenal these phenomenal aspects, their collocation, their combination, it's the redness and the and the, the taste and the smell, mm -hmm. the touch, all of all of that. On the other hand, right, that would be in support of something that can be called subjective idealism. I, right. It's that it's just in my individual mind, in my individual psychology. On the other hand, that proposition of subjective idealism seems to be equally unsupportable and bizarre. Right? To say that it is only because of my individual psychology, my individuality, that this apple now exists. And I come across um, uh, some old book, right? And it brings me knowledge that I did not have, period. I did not have it, right? I, I, I plug in numbers into a calculator. It gives me an answer that I could not have come up with using my own resources. So it, to say that there is no external world, uh, uh, right, seems as bizarre and unsupportable as it is to say that qualities can exist independent of a subject. We get, we get the problem, right? I can't say that redness exists without a perceiver, but I also can't say where the redness of an apple and the smell and the touch and the taste, but I also can't say that I made all of that up, quote unquote, right? That it's simply a figment of my own personal fancy. So uh, the argument then of a different sort of idealism would be that there need be a, a cause sufficient to invoke these uh, experiences right. as appropriate, as demanded. I, and what that cause would be, obviously, how can we uh, know? But one thing that we can ask would be, what is the status of that which does not exist? When I say right now it is not snowing, what does that mean? I'm evoking, I'm referring to snow positively, and I'm comparing and contrasting that with that which I do perceive. And that forms the statement, it is not snowing. But all the aspects of that statement positively exist. The snow exists and that which I perceive exists and so forth. So to, for something to not exist seems to demand what can be called a mind, right? Uh, uh, such that can permit those positive negations and say that it is not snowing. I, I am not remembering now most of the memories that I have. I, I'm not experiencing most of the things that I have experienced. So per this argument, the only way to explain how and why we have the experiences which we do have when we do have them uh, would be to not either say that there is some kind of noumena, right, that could never be known on principle and that causes all of that via, you know, the photons bounce around and, and the this and the that, right? Not that, and also not, quote unquote, subjective idealism, that it's just something that I make up. It's something subjective. It's just my own, you know, uh, solipsistic fancy or whatnot but that there is a cause, perhaps with a capital C, such that is capable of producing uh, uh, the experiences that the logic of the world, the logic of the re of reality, excuse me, demands when and where appropriate. And that would seem to then point to a unity such that does not contradict 
the plurality, but such that consummates that plurality or such that that plurality is found, say, in or by the way of which or something perhaps along those lines. Right, right. No, and it makes sense that they're, and I don't believe it's a naive re realism that matter does exist and matter itself, which I think you were alluding to, has to have a material cause. There has to be a material cause of matter, which um, would seem to be within, because like comes from like, which is a classical principle, which would be within matter itself. So is there like a first matter? It seemed like there would be some primordial, like a primordial matter. And yes, it seems like that would be such the case, maybe a matter that's not a specific this thing, but that at least has a potency to become a this and this is where we're getting very metaphysical, the, what they call prime matter, the, the scholastics would call prime matter, even though matter always has to be a this particular thing. Um, you know, it would seem that the, that at least in, in prime matter, it would it would have the potency to become whatever it can, um, which is a, a very metaphysical. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, the problem with Berkeley and, and a lot of these monists is that they become very rationalist and they 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 want to use like mathematical reasoning and not and 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 deny what's obvious, right? Deny what we immediately experience, which is the sense experience. So the senses receive, and you've alluded this to also, they're passive. They respond to stimuli. I mean, they they, they respond to the stimuli from the external environment so i'm seeing right now i'm seeing you but i'm not there's nothing in me that's that's causing that willingly at least so it has to be from an external uh source where my senses respond to passively respond to the environment and i can actively do something with that right i can reject i could talk to you not talk to you i can i can, I can i'm responding to what i'm passively receiving so yes material existence does exist and it was funny because someone tried to refute berkeley who said uh i mean you really can't refute him but um i think i think it was a pastor who said um i refute him thus and he just kicked a can down the street and uh basically Samuel matter John just kicked, kicked it. the rock right yeah, I kicked the rock yeah he kicked the rock so basically it's uh and i and, and i think what, what some people may call naive realists these these rationalist monists is something we need to we need to affirm the self-evident matter has to exist there is material cause and we talk about formal causes and then god as being the ultimate cause but there has to be a first cause within matter itself as a first principal cause right um in inter internal cause rather um all right well I'll, I'll give you the last word if you want to say something and then uh we'll end it when did yeah, well well said. Yeah, let's just try to grasp because that's that one simple point that I yeah. think is really essential. You ever play uh, video games or computer games? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in in a video game, right, you see, for example, you're walking along and you see, um, uh, you know, the tree. And then you pass it. What is then the status of that tree that was shown on the screen? Um. Yeah, I don't know. It's gone. It doesn't exist, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So the only imagery that is displayed on the screen is that which logically is appropriate based on the movement of the, the joystick or the, the controller or whatnot. All of mm -hmm. the other content does not exist at that moment, right? You go closer to something in a video game and you and it's bigger. You go farther away, it's smaller, right? All of that. None of those appearances do or can exist aside from when they are shown. That's the only logically conceivable thing here, right? Unlike, say, a photo album where all of the photos exist at the same time, a movie or a video game, it's only showing one appearance at a time, that which is appropriate. Now, the status of everything else in the video game, aside from that which is right now on the screen, we can say is, is not, does not exist. Right? But we went through the logic of positive negations. Does not exist means does exist and something else is Two things simultaneously exist such that varies. Snow exists and everything that I now see exists, which is different than snow. And therefore I say it is not snowing. So what exists then in the video game? Well, only one appearance is shown as it concerns the rest of the appearances is what we would call information, right? For example, metallicized metals, 
um, uh, or excuse me, magnetized metals, whatever the experts would say concerning that, right? However, it's encoded. That's what exists. And it's simply that it is converted to the correct appearance when logically appropriate. And when I come across the train, the video game, when I'm looking through the window, this and that. So the argument that we made is that that is the sole logic that is conceivable concerning any and all phenomenal reality, right? There cannot be all of the possible appearances, all the possible appearances, excuse me, cannot possibly exist at the same time. Right now, does the appearance that would be had if you put a mirror at the back of your head, does that exist? Um, yeah, as an appearance, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, at least I wouldn't be perceiving it as an appearance. As It doesn't, right? Because there's a million appearances there. I can bring the mirror further away, closer. Again, we can dim the light. There's all these different appearances, which we would say are all of the back of, the back of your head. None of them right now exist. So to use the analogy of the video game, the only way, again, the present argument is saying, the only way that that can exist is as information, is as potential experiences. Right? Now, somebody could immediately say, oh, does that mean we're in assimilation? No, there's very sound arguments to say we are not, quote unquote, in assimilation. That would require this simulation of the entire subject who is self-active and therefore it's impossible, we would say, to, to simulate a self-active subject. So we're not in assimilation in that artificial sense, but in a different sense, such that there must be a cause or there must be a reality uh, or, or mind such that has, uh, say, the information, all of the information for all of the relevant appearances at the same time, that there doesn't seem to be any way out of it, right? Just like there's no way out as it concerns a video game, but to say, that all of the appearances that are not now showing on the screen exist as information. What else can we say? How yeah. come I left in the video game, I left my uh, you know, gun or whatnot, if it's that kind of game, I left it there, then I log in the next day and I walk to the given spot and I find the gun in the video game. Where was that before? In information. The information uh, uh, turned into the relevant appearances as applicable and appropriate. Again, that seems to be the sole logic that can account for the phenomenal world and that would posit again a cause commensurate to that and that would of course put us as sentient subjects uh, as finite uh, subjects such as you said that passively receive these things to some extent passively into some relation with that cause and that would then be the main concern not uh, you know uh, how exactly do objects exist and stones exist that's interesting but our relation to reality that would be kind of the preeminent Problem. Yeah, but the the problem with that though is sorry, Bill. The problem with that though is that you we can give appearance an ontological status. Um, so we can conclude with this. So really, uh, I mean, it's interesting, but appearance by its very nature needs to be perceived. Appearance is is what is doesn't have any ontological reality in itself by definition. So appearance will not exist if it's not doing that. If it's not appearing to to a subject. In that sense, so, so that that cannot be, and this is what happens with phenomenology. Husserl, um, I mean, at the beginning, he was very much steeped in realism, but he 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 took that idea, you know, the idealist bent, and uh, that that's idealism ultimately. When we give the phenomenon, the the appearance, really, this ontological status, because again, then we make ourselves, and we're then we're really going into Berkeley's position. It would seem that we're giving. Uh, the being is just what is perceived. But we're, what we're trying to establish is, and science has to establish this also for science to exist, is that really there has to be some primordial stuff that has as, as a substance that, that has a, there's a substratum which subsists independently from any appearance, though it is the basis of all ulterior subsequent uh appearances but you know interesting discussion uh we get more into this i think the nature of an appearance i think this will be very good for our next video um i think it's a good segue to the next video so uh thank you very much guys for tuning in and um until next time we'll see you god bless